and um, David directed it, and, but they, together they made the head. And um, so they were out there standing and standing until Jack said that he had no more fingerprints left. And um, I just remember uh, Jan coming out, you know, into the yard to see, you know, how's the big egg? And um, all the neighbors, it was a little apartment kind of house thing on San Vicente Boulevard in Los Angeles. And the neighbors would lean over the fence and ask, how's the big egg? And um, actually, Jenny knew it was uh, ahead, but she couldn't tell anybody because she was sworn to secrecy. And when she would come down to the eraser head set to visit her dad and all of us, because we were all working on it all the time, she would ask uh, David if she could play with the baby. And he would say, yes, but don't touch it. <laughs> so that's the kind of life this person had. And look at how well she's turned out. <laughs>
to make it light, and that was not going to do. So they went on an emergency mission to find a ponderosa pine. Now, you may think that here we are in this beautiful state of Washington, and there's a lot of ponderosa, but there, there aren't a lot around here. There's a lot of dug fur. So the prop guy went a, a long way away to get this um, log, and he brought several of them back. And uh, David would hold them and then give them to me to hold. And finally, he brought the right log. It had to have two little branches. And we, we're not calling them arms. We're not anthropomorphizing the log in any way. It's just a log. <laughs> we don't say he or she. We say it. And he handed me the log. And we just knew. We knew, you know, this log. And then... I've often said no tree's lives were lost for this log, a portion of a tree, but not the whole tree. So, um, and the, the guy who cut it um, did tell me a long story about how he had to talk to somebody about getting it, but he, he managed to get it. I think that's confidential. But um, when he handed it to me, it was oozing sap, and it was very heavy. In fact, so heavy that at the end of that first day of shooting, I was very sore. And when we went to do our little star picks baseball cards, remember those cards? And we've signed some of those tonight. Um, we, we had the opportunity to write our story on the back, like where we went to school, what our greatest strengths were. And as a result, I got to write mine, and I said that my greatest strengths were my forearms. <laughs> Undisclosed location. It's with the humidifier going at all times because it's dried a little bit, as have I. And um, I would bring it with me here, but TSA won't let me bring it on a plane because of the um, fact that it could be used as a bludgeon. I would <laughs>
or adventurous or will say, yeah, let's go get a book. Lucy would be reading a book on Tibet after she had a lecture from Agent Cooper about Tibet. <laughs> Whoever was there said, no, you can't have a book. I'm not making it for you. I said, well, why can't I use this big ledger here? And I could just give me a Sharpie. And, no, you can't do it.
up by the roadhouse for shooting every day that we've been up here. That's why it's such a, it's a little, it's not hard being up here, but it's very, it can be very emotional, like Kimmy was saying a little bit, because it was very intense when we shot the pilot. And I, I mean, I still think the whole series should have been shot up here. But, um, So how it went was, I every day would wake up having to slap myself going, you're working with David, you know. Um, and and he's, he's really nice. He's very lovable and likable. And it's like, it's it's usually there's an ego or there's like you're scared. I was always nervous. I'm a nervous guy anyway. But I was always nervous, uh, you know. Uh, and he maybe put me at ease, you know, and that was really cool. But I'm walking along and, and by the roadhouse at night, it was so beautiful. It was like raining. I just got my like second lesson on the Harley or whatever because I've never ridden a street bike. <laughs> and we're um, we're like in between stuff. They're lighting something inside the roadhouse, and he's like alone. I didn't even know it was David at first. There's nobody outside. The only reason you know it's David is because of his hat. And he's standing there in the middle of the parking lot, and it's drizzling. And all I saw like his his bill was like this, and he's like staring down. This is all I see is like a guy. At first, then I realized it was David. All I saw was, all I saw was this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it was disturbing. I was like, hey, okay. And he was right by a good bathroom. He was right by a trailer that had bathrooms. And I was like, then I realized it was David. And I went, wow. And I didn't want to bother him. I didn't know what he's doing. And I knew he was into meditation, so I didn't know what was going on. I just went, <laughs> <laughs> so I walk around to be respectful. And I'm going to the bathroom, and he goes, James. James. You know, and I come walking over, you know, and I'm like, oh my god, you know, we can't. It's cool, I get to have a conversation. He's always busy, you know, and, you know, we're gonna hang out. I get to hang out with David. <laughs> walking over, I said, yeah, and he goes, that's so beautiful. <laughs> and I go, what? And I was like, you know, and he says, just look at that. And so then, it, about three comedic moments happened in a row. It was like, I, visually, it was like, there was this tall guy looking down, built like, like this on his hat, and it was like this greasy, oily puddle. So I'm getting, isn't this beautiful, and it is like this disgusting puddle. And he's like in bliss about it, and I'm like, oh, okay. So there was that one, and then I walk over, and he's like, there's this rainbow in it from the oil. So okay, maybe he's talking about the rainbow or something. And then all of a sudden I realized that there is, you know, like, one, two, like, uh, cigarette butts, and then another cigarette butt over here, and the Bang Bang Saloon sign that the props department put up, which is neon, was reflecting in that, and the, the bullets were the cigarette butts that happened to be perfectly placed, and the rest of it, and I, it took me a minute, and he goes, come here. And then a part of me just went, I can't believe he's including me in this <laughs> I was like going, you know, and what do you want with that? Cheese, okay, about two months ago. And now David's asking me my advice on a creative, you know, okay. So, and I'm like, uh, yeah, and I get close to him and I'm like, oh my god, I see it. And he goes, shh, shoot it. And I was like, yeah. And I'm like, right. And then he walked away and the crew got around and he shot it and I think, um, I forgot, Josh, of course, knows. It ended up somewhere in one... I'm sorry?
true. I did live in the country. I lived in Topanga outside of Los Angeles, so I guess uh, David thought, uh, you know, we'd say would be an appropriate house <laughs> gathering to come, you know, for it to be in the country. But anyway, so we gave me a script, uh, which was about that thick, and I did not understand anything about it. Uh, somebody was asking me, what is the eraser made about? I said, God, I never knew. <laughs> I never did that. I just, you know, I'm an actress, but I just, uh, I just follow what the director says. You know, I didn't understand anything about that suitcase scene, not a clue, and he just said, keep pulling at that suitcase till I tell you to go, and so I did, and that's what, that's what happened. But, anyway, <laughs> um, uh, anyway, I'll get to this point. Um, he said that there was a special scene he was going to shoot, um, and he needed to make a cast of, of my abdomen because uh, there was a scene where Henry pushes on Mary's stomach and breaks through into a pit which has a bunch of fetuses in the bottom. And so we needed a special effect, and so I went over to their house, and you had some kind of back room, like a porch or something in the back, and you had this, I don't know if it was a table, I think it was a table that I laid on, and he painted me with moulage. You know what moulage is? So when you're doing the casting, it's this kind of rubber stuff that you, you paint on and then you do the plaster of Paris on top of that because it gets every little detail. Well, he did that. He did that from like from like here to about here. And that was fine. You know, I went home. He calls me in a couple of days and said, it didn't work. I need one. I, it wasn't enough for your body. So, now, I did not know David at all. I had met him one, uh, twice now. Once at your house, once at my house. I do not know him at all. So I go back to your house and lay down on the table again, and this time he paints me with roulage from here to here. <laughs> yeah, the and first one didn't little, work. <laughs> <laughs> every little bit of me. And I laid there, because it was my roommate, you know. And, um, and so then I had to wait while, they, while the plaster of Paris dried. Now this time it's all the way around here, to here, from here, to there, to here, and I am stuck in this huge cast of plaster Paris. Then we have to get it off. <laughs> A lot of hands were needed for this. None of which were mine. And they had to dig and push and pull and yeah, you can get imagination. So, um, I felt that David and I knew each other very well after that. <laughs> and it turns out that they didn't use it after all. Oh. Oh, yeah. Who knew? Who knew? <laughs> it, they, it turned out that the effect didn't work, but he still did the punching through. You know, that they tried to make it work, but it didn't. So David gave me the cast. I still have it hanging in my bedroom. Oh. Yeah, a cast of my better body and better days. <laughs> Which is kind of nostalgic, I like that. Anyway, um, that's how I got to know David Lynch. <laughs> But 
and when Alvin is in the middle of these big trucks, and I had the trucks all around him. But uh, other than that, he didn't like surround. He actually wished he could mix his mono. And uh, so I had the guide track transferred from the magnetic film two track master of Twin Peaks Firewalk with me. And I had to keep referring to that. And David would come up. He was in his office most of the time, and I'd work all day, and he'd come up and check what I did. And then he'd always have me put up the two track, and then the surround mix. And he'd either say, no, that's too much in the surrounds, or, you know, whatever. And, uh, uh, but I remember specifically the pink room scene. He really loved it. And, uh, but when the, when the thing came out on DVD, you folks, and all of your kindred gave me hell about being able to understand the dialogue in that scene. And, and I said, it's no different. It's the exact same volume as its counterpart in the stereo mix, but now you have a specific center channel dialogue speaker. And the music and effects are out here, and the dialogue is here, and you can hear it better. And uh, it was quite a controversy at the time. But, uh, uh, and, and I had to defend it for a number of years. But in truth, the science is, it's exactly the same as the two-track theatrical mix. But most people had never seen it in the theater. They'd only had the VHS tapes. And that was very misleading. Anyways, David was my client before I worked for him. I had a technical design firm that I built studios all over the world. And David was a client. And I was designing the whole technical end of his studio, implementing it, buying the gear, having it installed, designing the wiring loom and all that stuff. And he had just wrapped Lost Highway. And the Madison House from Lost Highway became the studio. And as soon as they were done shooting and they had they didn't have a lock on the picture yet, but they knew they didn't have any more pickup shots to do. We knocked down about 75% of that house and rebuilt it as the recording studio with David's painting studio on top. Uh, so I remember one bitter cold February day in 97, right about the time of the cast and crew screening, which I did not go to for Lost Highway, I wish I had. But uh, we're sitting on the cement in the dirt of what was to be the studio. And uh, he first brought up that I should maybe be involved in the studio, and I, I just I dismissed it. Then, in August of 97, he had shot a Honda Passport commercial uh, where this person walks up from an LA subway station under a full moon, sees this Honda Passport revolving on a turntable, and morphs into a mountain man. And it became the longest running car commercial in television history. Most car commercials run uh, roughly 10 weeks. This ran nine months. It started in the New Year's uh, uh, World Series of uh, 97 and ran until June of 98. And there wasn't a single word of narration in it. And the night we mixed it, the studio wasn't done. And I was still installing gear, so I had to put a, a three-quarter inch tape deck on the back of the credenza, which had some gear in it, but a bunch of holes, run cables over the floor, back to the video projector, and up to the sound amplifiers and all that stuff. It was an absolute mess. And then uh, uh, he had ordered up some Foley uh, uh, for the thing, and the footsteps of the guy coming up out of the subway were on wood, and it was obviously cement. So we had some little uh, area behind the console of cement so we could zip our chairs around on. I was wearing dress shoes that night. I said, just a minute. I went and got a microphone, stuck it next to the next to my feet. And I walked it. And, uh, uh, and then, then we had to correct Foley for the spot. And that night he goes, you know, you're the only one that knows how this studio works. You're going to have to run it. <laughs> and I said, I can't afford the pay cut. And Monday morning, I resumed the install of the studio. It was still a couple weeks away from being finished. And about a week later, 
I mean, I've really enjoyed my career behind the console, pushing faders and playing with knobs. And uh, about a week later, I realized he's not going to ask that again. That window, your life is a one-way hallway. You pass windows and doors, and they open or they don't. And you can choose to partake of an episode, but you can't come back to it. And so I said, I said, well, what are you talking about money-wise anyway? <laughs> and so we went, we had lunch in the, in the studio building there. His assistant used to bring his lunch every day. And, uh, and he mentioned a figure which was about, it was less than half of what I was currently earning. And he said, oh, man, I can't do that. So I got a family, I got a house, blah, 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 blah. And so he said, well, you know, I, I pay Alfredo, the guy that has built his whole complex by hand, that amount, and he does the work of 10 men. And I went, okay, fine. I'll just continue designing studios. And uh, a day or two later, he comes back and he ups the offer by 50%. It was still a cut, but it was a cut I could live with. And so I went for it. And uh, uh, it became such a wonderful, wonderful time in my life. I had come out of a studio in Maui with Walter Becker from Steely Dan, and, and as Walter said, we did Donald Fagan's Comic Curia album, three years for eight songs. And uh, uh, as he said, Donald slices a finer pair. So I came out of the Steely Dan school of finer finishing into David Lynch land, where David throws a lot of stuff at the wall, and whatever sticks, that's what you work with. And, and so he's very improvisational, person. And the first thing we did was this album called Lux Bivens for Jocelyn Montgomery. It was the 12th century, 1100s, uh, 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 a mystic nun who had visions and wrote music. And she invented the staff. She used the lines of the hand as the staff lines and would point to the nuns what note to sing. And uh, uh, so, so this woman came in and recorded the uh, vocals against the drum, and then David and I removed the drone and built this whole cinematic, it's a movie without the picture, that album. And we had so much fun doing it that when we were done, he said, let's keep going on, let's keep experimenting, let's keep making music. And that was the genesis of Blue Bob. And we started from then on out, and it was a wonderful, wonderful time. <laughs> I never told it. I barely ever told the story. I just 
remember, we hooked up the motorcycle guys with the James thing, and it, it taught me how to ride. They turned out to be ex uh, outlaw bikers up here, and um, you know, real hardcore dudes and all that. And they took me out and they taught me how to, you know, ride the deal, da 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 da, and whatever. And I took the jacket from the guy and I showed wardrobe, and they talked to them and they said, Can we rent this jacket from him? He's like, Of course, blah, 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 whatever. So I'm like, Cool. And they said, Just to get used to it, why don't you keep it and wear it? and take it off set and stuff until you can get it on picture. Then once it's on picture, you're gonna have to hold on to it. But. So, okay, cool, so the first couple of nights we were up here, and I go up to, uh, we all had this, I don't know if you guys remember the get together. Um, yeah, we had the get together at the house, and Mark Frost, we all got, they said, everybody's gonna get to know each other from the initial cast. So we're gonna go up to this house, and you guys are gonna sit at a long table, and we're all just gonna bullshit and stuff, and get, get used to each other. And Mark asked if we went up, and I got this big badass leather jacket on. And um, <clears throat> and then Mark started in with like, okay, you guys gotta pick, you guys gotta pick an um, animal. This is gonna be telling us who you are and all this. And we pick it, the first animal that's you, the second animal that we think is you, and all this. And all these psychological tests for a joke, just to kind of get to know each other. I'm like, cool, we're starting to think about it. And everybody's getting loose and they're taking off their Somebody takes off their jacket and sits down, and I pick a chair, and I come over, and I take off the leather jacket, and I got it by the collar, and I go to put it on the back of the chair, and a 38 falls on the table. <laughs> and everybody kind of went, what the F did you hire? <laughs> Who is this guy? And I just went, oh. <laughs> And I went, you know, okay. So that's the story, obviously. Put it back, I went back to the dude, and he's like, dude, you left your
like that real sort of romantic, <coughs> over the top, like shredding keyboards almost to distortion. And, you know, that, you know, Bowie's good at that. Old Bowie does stuff like that. Like just real, you know, right? And, and, um, so, but I said, it can't be that, but that vibe. And Angelo goes, got it. And he's like, dun, 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 dun. and he starts doing this thing. And David goes, James, stick with me. Just you. And he starts writing it. And he starts going, just you, just you. And so I start singing it with him. He goes, sing it with me. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, Angelo. And Angelo's kind of like, Angelo's real hyper. So it was really fun to work with him. He's like, okay, 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 do this. from New Jersey. We're both from New Jersey. So he's like, hold it, James. Do it right here. So, Bridget Tunnel. So, so, so we're, we're doing it, and then David writes all the lyrics and stuff, and then I actually like sang it with them in that key, and he's like, wow, it's not bad. I could sing really high falsetto sometimes, like good, and then decent staying in key and stuff. So he was impressed that I could do that, and I was like, okay, cool. You know, and we set it all up, and Angelo was happy with it, and you know, we're gonna be in the studio with this James in two weeks, okay? So come and bring your guitar, and record it, and, and we'll do it, whatever. So, Long story short, obviously, it's like I get to the studio in Hollywood, I bring my guitar, they pre-recorded it with the ex-guitar player, I believe it was John Doe, and he did all the guitar for it. And um, I was, I was, you know, I was like sad, sort of, I was like, oh, I thought I was gonna get to, you know, we are gonna play guitar, and I was like, oh, well, okay. He goes, no, you're gonna just do the singing track. We got, and it was, he was really happy because he was in the middle of the whole show. He was in the middle of that and trying to do all this other stuff. So he was like, no, please just sing. Let's get through this. I go, okay. And I start, and it's like, it's in this key. The key, it, whatever, it was C, but it was like, whether it was tuned up a little bit, I don't know what it was, and it was not my key, and I couldn't get it, and it was like, eh, like I was straight to get it. He goes, what happened? You did it so great on set. And I go, whatever that piano was, when I go, what do you, are you doing, did you do it in the same key, Angelo? And he said, no, it's in C. That was in like G or whatever. And I said, oh, God, you know. So that's why at times it almost sounds like it gets a little squeaky. But that's basically the whole story of it. And that was a lot of fun. It's not that. 
the whole time he's been, they've sort of been with each other as this crazy girl's been going nuts, and boom, it happens, and then he realizes that he's really, really in love with this girl, and it becomes, it becomes authentic. And what I didn't like was then it became tacky when he went with the Evelyn thing. Yeah. And The Evelyn thing was a fill-in, almost, because of what all the other characters were doing and they didn't know what to do with my character. And I wasn't, I wasn't sophisticated enough to fight for myself. I thought, if I say anything, who am I? Because that's production. And everybody who does that is kind of a prima donna, I thought. So, I don't want to mess with production and if this is what they're doing, I'll go with it, you know. So, but I didn't agree with it, and I did tell him that. I did say, look, I don't really agree with it because his, but I'll do it, but his thing is that he hasn't, it takes away the innocence and it takes away the authenticity of their own love, like their own, yeah. And, and what, that was basically why James and Donna were the only non, they were freaks because they were the only non-freaks in the whole show, which made them freaks in a way. There was freaking, you know, but in a way, not, they had to keep that innocent through line through, and when that was broken, it became a little bit cold, like, so, but yeah, but yeah, You're thanks. What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got one over here? Oh, yeah, we know we got to get one tricks. This is None of us, to 
my knowledge, not, no one knew except Patty Norris and um, David. It was a huge secret. And this new Japanese actor came on the set, and we I didn't know. <laughs> None of us knew that it was Piper. For It was really a well-kept secret for a number of times, I think, maybe three days. You know, there's this panel that we did at USC Film School that Woo! you can get on YouTube. You can get it on YouTube, I think. And, or Trojan Vision. Yeah, somebody knows about it. Okay. Um, and that that story is told in that panel, the real story of what happened. But Pi And Piper talked about it when really no one knew. So it was a huge, I mean, I had a whole conversation with her, not knowing that it was the woman I usually sat next to in the trailer. So it was pretty well kept, didn't you think? Yeah. It was, it was a very well-kept secret. That's why it was like, that's what was so, you know, 
you regret that it is. So, you know, so, you know, so yeah, thanks.